Lectures on the Politics of God and the Politics of Man Lecture 1 Introduction Part 1 Politics and religion are inseparable. This fact alone accounts for the persecution of the early church by the Roman state. Francis Legg stated the matter clearly when he wrote, and I quote, The officials of the Roman Empire in time of persecution sought to force the Christians to sacrifice, not to any of the heathen gods, but to the genius of the emperor and the fortune of the city of Rome, and at all times the Christians' refusal was looked upon not as a religious, but as a political offence. Unquote. At the trial of Christ, the chief priests of the Jews said to the officials of the Roman Empire, We have no king but Caesar. The early Christians, when faced with the same question, replied, We have another king. His name is Jesus Christ. The Romans understood what this meant. Either Jesus would bow the knee to Caesar, or Caesar would have to bow the knee to Jesus Christ. The church faces this same question again today and in a way that she has not had to face it since the days of the Roman emperors. Who is Lord? Christ or Caesar? Christ or the modern secular state? There was and is no third option, no third way. This was and still is a political issue. Jesus Christ was victorious in his struggle with the Roman state. He will be victorious in his struggle with the modern secular state. The only question that remains is this. On whose side will you stand? Whom are you for? Whom will you obey? The Lord Jesus Christ or the modern, idolatrous, secular state? Christianity is not a mystery cult, a private devotional worship hobby that could find a quiet place in the greater context of ancient Roman idolatry. Christianity is not comparable with the mystery cults that were popular in ancient Rome. For the early church, merely adding Christ to the Roman pantheon, a tactic that was tried unsuccessfully by at least two Roman emperors, would have been a denial of his lordship and sovereignty and would have successfully neutralised Christianity as a threat to the Roman state. But Christianity is more than a devotional cult. It is a religion that structures the whole of man's life. Both the early church and the Roman state understood this. Modern Christians on the whole have signally failed to understand this. And it is this failure that accounts for the decline of Christianity in the West today. The Lord Jesus Christ does not merely demand that we refrain from burning the incense to Caesar. He demands that Caesar burn the incense to him and acknowledge his lordship and sovereignty over Rome and the empire. To burn the incense to Caesar was to acknowledge that Caesar was the political overlord. For Christians, to refuse to burn the incense meant that Jesus Christ is the political overlord, the king of kings to whom all kings must bow, Caesar included. There is no area of religious neutrality anywhere in the created order. Politics is not a religiously neutral enterprise. It is an intensely religious enterprise. Burning the incense was a religious act of political submission. Refusing to burn the incense was not a religious crime in the narrow sense, that's to say, a devotional offence. It was rather a religious act of political rebellion against Rome. The Church in the 21st century must recognise this truth and begin living in terms of it, as did the early church, by challenging the political idolatry that is destroying the Western world today. Only when the church awakens from the deadening slumber that has overtaken her, and proclaims once more the lordship and sovereignty of Jesus Christ over the whole of life, including the political realm, will the world be delivered from its slavery and bondage to sin, as manifested today in the politics of rebellion against God. And only then will the world experience real freedom, the glorious liberty that the gospel of God brings to all nations that submit to Jesus Christ as Lord and Saviour. The law and gospel of God is a public truth, a light not only for man's personal devotions, but also for the government of nations. This is not a new doctrine, 
it is the established orthodox teaching of the Christian faith. For example, on the 2nd of June 1953, Queen Elizabeth II was crowned in Westminster Abbey. One of the first things she did in the coronation ceremony was to swear an oath that she would, to the utmost of her power, and I quote, maintain the laws of God and the true profession of the gospel, and to the utmost of her power, maintain in the United Kingdom the Protestant Reformed religion established by law, unquote. After swearing this oath, a Bible was presented to the Queen with the following words, and I quote, Our gracious Queen, to keep your majesty ever mindful of the law and the gospel of God as the rule for the whole life and government of Christian princes, we present you with this book, the most valuable thing that this world affords. Here is wisdom. This is the royal law. These are the lively oracles of God. Unquote. The law and gospel of God must inform all that we think, say and do as individuals and as nations. Only when submission to the Lord Jesus Christ becomes a reality in the life of the nations of the earth can it be said that the Great Commission is being fulfilled, since the Great Commission is not a command to disciple individuals from among the nations, but a command to disciple the very nations themselves. It is this comprehensive nature of the Christian faith that these lectures seek to explore, but especially as the faith relates to the realm of politics, social order and national life. The common theme running through these lectures is the nature of Christianity as public truth. Over the past century, Christianity has increasingly ceased to function as public truth in the Western nations. Whatever a society considers to be public truth will inevitably function as the religion of that society. What functions as public truth in modern Western nations is secular humanism. Secular humanism is the religion of the West today. Christianity has been reduced to the status of a mere mystery cult, that's to say a personal salvation cult. But secular humanism is too weak to function as a stable foundation for civilization. Nor is this a problem that can be corrected. The spiritual and moral relativism that lies at the heart of secular humanism's core values make it impossible for secular humanism to function as a stable foundation for civilization. Like its offspring, multiculturalism, secular humanism is a temporary phenomenon a staging post in a process of transition from one civilization to another. Eventually, the secular humanist multicultural society must give way to the dominating influence of some other religion as the foundation of Western civilization. It is my contention that only the Christian religion can provide a true, stable and lasting foundation for civilization and that the abandonment of Christianity as public truth in the 20th century has led the world into chaos. The answer to the chaos that the modern world faces is therefore the revival of Christianity as public truth, that is to say, as the religious foundation of our civilization, in terms of which both individual men and nations, with their civil governments, must organise their whole life by conforming to the precepts and teachings of the Bible. In other words, Christianity must be the established religion of all nations. This is precisely what the Great Commission calls for. But this will not be possible without the manifestation of the Kingdom of God in the lives of both individual Christians and the Christian communities of all nations as a concrete social order that models to the world what true society should be, and by doing this calls the world to repentance and faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Without the manifestation on earth in tangible form of this prophetic social order, the world will not be one for Christ. The Christian community is to be a light to the world. Only as that light is seen, 
That is to say, only as Christians are seen living as a real social order that transforms the whole life of man, will the world be drawn to it. And it shall come to pass in the last days, says the prophet Isaiah, that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established in the top of the mountains, and shall be exalted above the hills, and all nations shall flow unto it. And many people shall go and say, Come ye, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, and he will teach us his ways, and we will walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth the law, and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. And he shall judge among the nations, and shall rebuke many peoples, and they shall beat their swords into plowshares, and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation shall not lift up swords against nation, neither shall they learn war any more. Unquote. Before going any further, I need to provide definitions for some important words and terms that I shall be using throughout these lectures. The rest of this lecture will be concerned with these preliminary definitions. First, the word church. There are problems with the use of the English word church. We use the word in a variety of ways to mean different things usually without defining what we mean and very often without even being aware ourselves that we are using the same term in different ways to refer to different things. This leads to confused thinking and consequently to misunderstanding. In order to avoid these problems we need to understand something of the etymology and history of the word and its use and we need to be careful in our use of the term to make sure that we understand ourselves and indicate clearly to others what we mean by it. The English word church comes from the Old English kirike or kirke, which is derived from the Greek word kirikon, meaning God's house, a popular 4th century form of the Greek word kyriakon, an adjective meaning imperial of the Lord. This Greek word was used of the Lord's house, Kyriakon Doma. The English word church is derived via this root from the Greek adjective Kyriakos. This adjective is used only twice in the New Testament, however, and in neither instance does it have reference to the Greek word ecclesia, which is the word usually translated as church in English translations of the Bible. In 1 Corinthians 11 verse 20 it is used of the Lord's Supper, and in Revelation 1 verse 10, it is used of the Lord's day. Nowhere in the New Testament is this term used to refer to the Lord's house. Strictly speaking, therefore, the notion or concept of the church is not part of the New Covenant, though it is, of course, part of the Old Covenant, that's to say, the temple. The concept of the church, that is to say, a building and its appurtenances, set apart as a special sanctuary for Christian worship, is not found in the New Testament and is not a feature of the New Covenant. In his translation of the New Testament, William Tyndale did not use the word church to translate the Greek word ecclesia and rendered it more accurately throughout as congregation. Nowhere in Tyndale's translation of the New Testament do we find the word church used of the assembly or community of believers. The New Testament does not identify the Ecclesia as the house of the Lord, that is to say, a building and its appurtenances, but as the people of God, a covenanted community called out of the world of sin and unbelief into fellowship with God as his holy nation. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9. Unfortunately, Subsequent translations of the Bible into English, including the Geneva Bible, did not follow Tyndale's lead in this matter and mistranslated the Greek word ecclesia as church. The Greek word ecclesia is derived from a Greek verb, ekalio, meaning to call out or summon forth. The noun ecclesia is a political term meaning an assembly of the citizens regularly summoned the Legislative Assembly. 
In its use of this term, therefore, the New Testament stresses not only that members of the body of Christ are called out of the world of sin and unbelief, but that they are also called into participation in a new political organism, a new community or society with its own distinctive social order, the kingdom of God. The English word church is used in most English translations of the Bible to translate the Greek word ecclesia. However, as we have already seen, this is a mistranslation since the ecclesia is not a building but an assembly of the people constituted as a body politic. There were, strictly speaking therefore, no Christian churches in the New Testament. Believers met in their homes or in other places but there were no specially designated buildings set apart for Christian worship. There was the temple, of course, and there were synagogues, where the first Jewish Christians probably worshipped on the Sabbath, but they were soon obliged to leave these, and they worshipped elsewhere on the Lord's Day, the day after the Jewish Sabbath, and Gentile Christians never worshipped in the synagogues. Originally, however, the term synagogue did not refer to a building either but to a gathering of people, an assembly, from the Greek word synago, meaning to gather together, and it was used of local communities of Jews who met together on the Sabbath for worship, instruction in the law, and for educational and social purposes. That is to say, it referred to people, a community, not to a building, and only came to signify a building at a later date, because of its use as a metonym for the building in which the community met. It was exactly the opposite with the term church. That is to say, the building, which is properly called a church from the etymological point of view, came to signify the community of Christians that met in it. According to the concise Oxford Dictionary of Current English, the English word church, with the first letter in lower case, can mean 1 a building for public worship, two, a meeting for public worship in such a building, then, with the first letter capitalised, three, the body of all Christians, four, the clergy or clerical profession, five, an organised Christian group or society of any time, country or distinct principles of worship, and six, institutionalised religion as a political or social force. In these lectures I shall use the word church to refer to the building and sometimes with reference to the rituals and forms of service that take place in the building. This corresponds to the concise Oxford Dictionary's definitions 1 and 2 already mentioned. This use of the word is not to be understood of the church as an institution which is a wider concept than the church as a building and the rituals and forms of service that take place in the building. I shall also use the word church to refer to the body of Christ, the Christian people or society, as an organism, that's to say the Christian nation, which includes the church as an institution, but is not limited to the church as an institution. The church as an organism is a much wider concept than the church as an institution and refers to the Christian nation or society. Where I refer to the church specifically as an institution, that's to say, as a cultic organisation with officers for governing a specific sphere of social life, in contrast to the church as an organism, it will usually be apparent that this is the case from the context. Nevertheless, where I think there may be misunderstanding, I shall make my intention clear. I do not use the word church to mean the clergy or the clerical profession. Second, the word religion. The term religion is commonly confused with the term theism. Theism refers to belief in a personal supernatural God, from theos, the Greek word for God. Theistic faiths are usually religions, but not all religions are theistic. Religion refers to the belief system or worldview that structures human thought, life and society. The word religion comes from the Latin word religio, which means obligation, bond, reverence for the gods, from the verb religare, meaning to bind. 
Inevitably, religion brings obligation, duty. That's to say, life in accordance with an obligation that binds man. The root of religio is lig, to bind, and is cognate with the word lex, meaning law. Religion, therefore, structures life. It structures the thought and life of the individual and of society. Christianity, Judaism and Islam are clearly religions that structure human thought, life and society. They are also theistic religions. Secular humanism is a belief system or worldview that structures human thought, life and society. It is therefore a religion, but it is not theistic. Someone who does not believe in a personal supernatural God is not a-religious, he is merely atheist. His religion is atheism. Although the religious nature of secular humanist beliefs is not acknowledged by many people, some secular humanists do recognise that secular humanism is a religion. See, for example, the Humanist Manifesto of 1933, the preamble to which speaks of religious humanism. The United States Supreme Court has also defined secular humanism as a religion. And I quote, Among religions in this country which do not teach what would generally be considered a belief in the existence of God are Buddhism, Taoism, ethical culture, secular humanism and others, unquote. And that is from Torcaso v. Watkins, 367 U.S. 488, 1961, footnote 11. Third, the terms politics, political, political sphere and political realm. I use the words politics and political in two ways. First, in the narrow or specific sense to refer to the sphere of civil government, that's to say the work of the magistrate or state. And second, in a wider sense, to refer more generally to the way the life of both the individual and society should be governed. The concise Oxford Dictionary of Current English defines the word politics as, and I quote, the art and science of government, unquote. The whole of life is political in this wider sense. In other words, it is the outworking of the law of an ultimate authority, that is a God, in the totality of life, whether that God is a personal supernatural being, such as the God of the Bible, an ideology or philosophy such as socialism, or even man himself as a self-proclaimed autonomous individual, in other words, anarchy. I use the words politics and political in this wider sense to include spheres and institutions other than the state, for example, the family and the church, which should be governed according to God's law, as should the state, and which do not derive their life or forms of government from the state, but from God via his word. The Bible teaches that God has committed the government of all the nations into the hands of his Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, and that the nations owe an absolute allegiance and obedience to him in all things. In this sense, the whole of life is about the politics of God, that is to say, how we are to be ruled by God's word as individuals and as a society, since his kingdom encompasses all things, in heaven and on earth. The work of the state is one aspect or sphere of the rule of Jesus Christ as king of kings, one aspect of his kingdom. There is no independent political sphere of life that does not owe obedience to the ruler of nations, who has delegated his rule to various institutions that are independent of each other and limited in authority. The state is only one of these institutions, but the Lord Jesus Christ rules over all things. His kingdom has no limits. Since politics is about how men are governed and all power and authority have been given to Jesus Christ, 
the whole of life is political in this wider sense. That's to say, it is about how man is to subject himself obediently to God in all things by governing himself, his family and his society according to God's law and thereby pursue the coming of the kingdom of God above all else. However, I use the terms political sphere and political realm to refer to politics in the narrow or specific sense. That's to say the work of the state or civil government. Fourth, the terms state, civil government and magistrate. I use the term state to mean the civil government or what used to be called the magistrate or civil magistrate. In other words, the Ministry of Public Justice. This concept of the state is a narrow one that is by no means shared by much of modern political thought. In the perspective of humanistic socialism, for example, the state is conceived in much broader terms, nearer perhaps to the concept of the nation than to that of the civil magistrate. As a Christian, I do not, of course, accept the socialist concept of the state, nor its vision of society, since it is a reductionist vision of mankind and society. That's to say, a vision that absolutizes and therefore idolizes one aspect of the created order above other equally legitimate aspects of creation that exist independently of the state. I use the term state as a synonym for civil government or civil magistrate. The concise Oxford Dictionary of Current English defines the state as, and I quote, an organised political community under one government, a commonwealth, a nation, unquote. I accept only the first part of this definition. The state is the political government of the nation in the narrow or specific sense. The political sphere, which is one aspect of society, one aspect of the nation, namely the Ministry of Public Justice. The nation includes all the other spheres of life as well as the political sphere. The state, therefore, should confine itself to the activities of a civil government or magistracy. However, the concept of civil government or the state as a ministry of public justice includes the executive, legislative, judicial, diplomatic, military and law enforcement functions of the state. My restriction of the function of the state or civil government, magistrate, that is to say, to that of administering public justice is not intended to exclude any of these necessary functions of the civil authorities, but it is intended to restrict such aspects of the state's work to their proper sphere of authority. All these aspects of the function of the state find their purpose in terms of the establishment and maintenance of public justice. Fifth, the word multiculturalism. The tension that large-scale immigration has caused in some cities and large towns in the United Kingdom and other Western countries is usually represented by British politicians and by the British media as a race relations problem. And multiculturalism, one of the chief shibboleths of the new atheist religion of secular humanism, is endlessly championed as the answer to this problem. Unfortunately, the real nature and meaning of multiculturalism has been misunderstood by politicians and media people alike and, along with the tension created by the presence of large Islamic and Hindu communities in British cities, has been defined in terms of race. But this is a serious mistake. Culture does not have its origin in race and the constant obsession with race by the media and politicians in British society only exacerbates the problem, since it reinforces the prejudices of fanatics while offering no meaningful analysis of the problem. Indeed, it gets in the way of a better understanding of the problem. Culture is a religious phenomenon. Christopher Dawson pointed out that, and I quote, from the beginning, the social way of life which is culture has been deliberately ordered and directed in accordance with the higher laws of life which are religion. Unquote. A people's religion comes to expression in its culture, said Henry Van Til. 
What underpins cultural differences, therefore, is not race, but religion, since culture is the incarnation of religion. Every social order, said R.J. Rushduni, and I quote, rests on a creed, on a concept of life and law, and represents a religion in action. Culture is religion externalised, unquote. Cultural tensions exist where religions come into conflict among populations. The conflict in India between Muslims and Hindus when the British Raj came to an end and India became independent was not based on racial differences, but on religious differences. It is true that culture, that's to say religion as it is externalised or incarnated in particular societies, sometimes exhibits its distinctive features along racial lines. That is to say, particular races that have lived without assimilating with other ethnic groups tend to maintain their own individual cultural identity. But the fact that cultural differences sometimes break down along racial lines in this way is entirely incidental and has no bearing on what determines a particular cultural identity. It is not race that determines culture, but rather religion. And this is also the case where racial differences between societies incidentally correspond to cultural differences. It is vitally important that we recognise that the concept of race is at most an incidental fact, likely to mislead us, not an essential element of culture, if we are to understand the problems posed by mass immigration from the third to the first world today. Race is irrelevant. Religion is what counts, what determines cultural identity. And we shall not get anywhere near to solving the multicultural problems that face our societies until this fact is recognised and people are prepared to deal with the issues that it entails. Sixth, and finally, the term world view. I use the term world view to mean the perspective in terms of which a man understands the whole of life and the world around him. A world view is a product of the presuppositions and preconceptions formed by the totality of one's experience of life. Everything that a person experiences will go in some measure towards forming his world view regardless of how self-conscious or unself-conscious he is of this, regardless even of whether he is aware of or understands the very concept of a world view. A man's world view is therefore personal and subjective, since each man will have a different personal experience of life and this will have a formative effect on his world view. A world view can be likened to a pair of spectacles tinted by a man's presuppositions and preconceptions about and his personal experience of life, through which he views, perceives and understands the world around him and the nature of reality itself. Of course, man is not only an individual, but also a member of society whose understanding of life is shaped by interaction with the community of which he is a part, especially as he imbibes the presuppositions and preconceptions of the community into which he is born and in terms of which he learns to make sense of life and the world around him as he grows up. Although truth is absolute, for man, understanding the truth always takes place in the context of community. Man does not come to an understanding of the world around him in isolation from others, but rather in community with others. Isolation leads men to question their understanding of truth. Complete isolation from community with others will lead men to lose their grip on reality. As human beings, we understand the truth not merely as individuals, but in relation to the community of which we are a part. There is, therefore, a strong social component and context to man's world view. The common shared presuppositions and experiences of a community will have a determinative effect on the worldview of those who constitute that community. Despite the personal and subjective nature of a person's worldview, therefore, we can speak of the worldviews of particular societies and communities which are rooted in the shared fundamental religious beliefs of those communities. For example, 
We can speak of the secular humanist worldview, which is the worldview generated by the dominance of secular humanist ideas as public truth in society. We can speak of the Muslim worldview, which is the worldview generated by the acceptance of Islam as the true religion by Muslim communities. We can speak of the Christian worldview, which is a worldview generated by the acceptance of Christianity as the true religion. And we can speak of the atheistic worldview, which is generated by the rejection of belief in a personal supernatural God. It is also possible to have a syncretistic worldview, that is to say, a worldview that is a product of the conflation of two or more religious belief systems. However, I also believe that the Bible gives us a worldview of its own, a worldview that gives us an objectively true view of reality, in terms of which we as individuals and as communities of faith in Christ must seek to conform ourselves in our understanding of all things. The biblical worldview is objectively true because it conforms to the Creator's word, which is truth. John 17 verse 17. However, the biblical worldview is not necessarily identical with the Hebrew worldview, since the Hebrews were often in rebellion against God and apostate, and their religion was often syncretistic. Likewise, the worldviews of individual Christians and Christian communities will to a greater or lesser extent, since they are the worldviews of fallen sinful individuals and communities that are not yet perfectly sanctified, fail to conform perfectly to the objectively true worldview given us in Scripture. This does not mean, however, that the individual and the community of faith, under the guidance and influence of the Holy Spirit, cannot increasingly conform their own world views to the world view given us in Scripture, and to the extent that they do so, their world views, though not perfect or infallible, will nevertheless be characterised by the objective truth of God's Word. The Lord Jesus said, and I quote, I have yet many things to say unto you, but ye cannot bear them now. How be it, when he, the Spirit of truth, that's to say the Holy Spirit, is come, he will guide you into all truth, for he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he will show unto you things to come. He shall glorify me, for he shall receive of mine, and shall show it unto you. Unquote. John 16 verses 12 to 14. Worldviews operate much of the time at a subconscious or subliminal level. As we go about life, we often do not assimilate the various experiences we have self-consciously into our worldview or self-consciously interpret our experiences in terms of our worldview. But we do assimilate our experiences of life into our worldview and interpret the world around us in terms of this worldview self-consciously or unselfconsciously. Some people will be more aware of their worldview than others, but everyone's worldview will operate subliminally some of the time. If, however, as Christians we are to understand the world that God has put us in, and the commission to disciple the nations that the Lord Jesus has given to us, it is important that we should understand how our worldviews affect both ourselves and the world we live in. If we are to understand and address meaningfully the age in which we live, and call all men and all nations to repentance and faith in Christ, we must be able to identify and mount an accurate and effective critique of their sin and apostasy, and be able to show how the Christian worldview differs from the non-Christian worldviews, and therefore how the Christian life in its fullness and in all its individual aspects differs from the life of non-belief. It is important, therefore, that we should self-consciously seek to understand the biblical worldview and bring our own worldview into conformity with it. And we must seek to understand the worldviews of the societies and communities that surround us so that we can challenge them with the truth and call them to repentance and faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. End of Lecture 1, Part 1